Hi guys and welcome back to my Evilness podcast. Today we are going to be talking about the murder of Ashley Pegram. Ashley Nicole Pegram was a 28 year old mother who lived in Dorchester County in Charleston was known as a farming county. They were known for soybeans, cotton and corn. Any crime really in the town was mainly drug related if there was any. Ashley's parents were Jimmy and Rayma Chance. They lived in a greenhouse with a brown roof and a green well-kept yard. Rayma Chance Ashley's mother said she liked the outdoors, shopping and helping others. The father of Ashley's youngest child, John, died after being hit by a truck. He was killed instantly. After that, Ashley drank to numb the pain. However, her mum didn't like drinking at the house or around the kids, so Ashley would leave to do that, her sister Brandy had said. After a while, Ashley began to use dating apps, specifically Meet Me. She was talking to one guy who online he was called Shane. She was supposed to be staying the weekend with him. However, they had had a fight and he brought her home early. She was pretty upset, so she jumped on there so she could find someone to take her out so she could drink, her sister had said. Friday the 3rd of April 2015, approximately 9pm, within two hours of chatting with some guy that she'd met online, she was already in the car with him. Ashley shared a mobile phone with her family, so as usual she left it at the house that night. The next morning, Ashley didn't return home. This was really out of character, her mum was instantly worried. Her mum had said that every time she came home, she called out, Mum, you know, just to let her know that she was home. But she didn't do it. So her mum called Brandy and said that she hadn't returned home. And Brandy also just knew that something wasn't right. Dr Eric Hickey, a criminal psychologist, said there were early warning signs with this date. Him staying in the car doesn't make him a bad person, but it would certainly put them on my radar he said brandy checked to see if the mobile phone the family shared was still there she found the phone and on it messages from ashley's date he said he left her at a gas station sonico and he put his phone number in the messages so brandy got her mum's mobile and started calling the number but he didn't even answer but eventually he did call back. Brandy asks, where is my sister? In the message, you said you left her at a gas station. What gas station? He later changed his story and said he left her in front of a mobile home park, Summer Village mobile home park. Brandy and her mum were walking up and down that road, looking in the ditches to see if maybe she got hit by a car or looking for a shoe, anything of Ashley's. Brandy stood on top of... Out of the Explorer, sorry, the car, to see further into the fields ahead. By now, fearing that her sister is in danger, Brandy calls the police, who tell her that a detective will be in touch Monday. First thing Monday, agents are able to assess the call. Ashley's date that night turned out to be Edward Bonilla. At the same time, I think I've said that right. He lived in a nearby town of Han. Was that Han Ran? I'm so sorry. (laughs) Which was basically a blue collar suburb of Charleston. He agreed to go in and speak to the police at 6 pm. That evening, he sat down for an interview. At first, he seemed cooperative, telling the detectives about the date. 
He said he picked Ashley up and took her to a bonfire party in Goose Creek at Lindsay Diaz's home, who was the girlfriend of Edward's brother, Anthony. Edward arrived at about 9.30pm with Ashley, who had never met Lindsay before. They left around 12pm. Edward said the reason was that Ashley was very intoxicated. But Lindsay had a different impression of Ashley that night. Lindsay had worked in the medical field and didn't think Ashley seemed very intoxicated. She saw them leave and Ashley had wanted to stay, but Edward was persistent that they leave. Ashley said she hadn't finished her beer. Edward said, that's okay, just take it. Grabbed a six-pack out of the fridge and they left. While they were driving, she said she needed the restroom, so they pulled in, pulled into a gas station. This Sunoco gas station. CC's TV footage from the 4th of April 2015 sees them pull in and park. Ashley exits the car and goes in by the main doors. She went in to use the restroom and then exited. The, yellow lab apparently the car that Edward was driving that night was actually his mother's car, a blue Hyundai Cyan, Cyantra, Sinantra, sorry, I don't know cars either, which Edward's mother and girlfriend picked him up from the police station in. The detective started taking photos and he noticed on the run, front right quarter panel what looked like a foot. The detective footprint or a shoe print, from a that they small at the bottom and large at the top. The spot where the print was on the car on the could have gotten on it if you was sort of the lying on your back on the ground to next to the car, kicking up. On the 14th of April, Ashley's family organised a search with the help of the local residents. Two cameras at a garage near Summer Village, one facing the intersection and one facing the road beside the mobile home park. Edward had said that he had driven up this road, which the camera is facing, and he pulled into a residential entranceway to let Ashley out to pee on the side of the road. And then he claimed he drove off and left her. From his statement, police went to the garage and contacted the owner, who gave them access to his camera, at which no time, at no point in time that night, did a vehicle matching his vehicle description drive down that road. Detective Andy Martin goes to his supervisor, Tony Finney, after the interview, and he said, I think we have a problem. He's getting suspicious of Edward. His story has holes, and a portion of that is the second bathroom stop. Detective Martin began to take a closer look into Edward's version of events, and things just were not adding up. One of the things he said was that he was unemployed. He said he was unemployable due to an ankle injury. However, Miss Diaz said he did work. The police rang this employer where they were told that he worked and asked if Edward was employed there and he was and they also asked if Edward has access to a vehicle or in vet or van and his employer said sure yeah he has a take home van Edward was on his way there as he had had something that he needed to remove from his van police also found out from this employer that Edward had taken the van there and locked it behind the gates on Friday night. Forensic evidence from the autopsy showing neck fractures and head trauma proves Ashley was a victim of a sustained attack. Whilst at the yard, Edward approached Detective Martin, who says, I thought you said you didn't have a job. And Edward says, well, I just got this job yesterday. Martin looked at the owner and said, is this true? Who said, no, Edward has worked for me for the past eight months. Detective Martin opens the back of the van to look inside and he sees a lot of red on the walls, on the ceiling and in various other locations. He calls in the crime scene analyst team. He goes back who tested the patches of splatter and a paint can Martin which had a very large dent in it and also a missing handle and all of these were positive for blood. The police then took DNA samples from then he took her body into the both Brandy and Rima. Vanilla was charged with first degree murder and he was convicted by Rima, sorry. 
and they took DNA standards which are a known DNA sample, for example, toothbrush, hairbrush, that were Ashley's. It took about four days to get the results back, but they came back and they were a match for Ashley. This DNA match changed the course of the investigation going from a missing persons case to a potential homicide. The police met with Edward's mother to ask her about the car that was used on the night of the day. She said it was parked at a location in North Charleston. They located the vehicle and seized it and took it back to the crime scene lab. Blood was found in the trunk. So far suggested to detectives that at some stage that night, Edward had moved Ashley from the Sonata to his work van. Detectives assessed CCTV footage from a college near Edward's home. The CCTV shows that he returned home in the Sonata at around 1.21am and left again in his work van at about 2.35am in the early hours of the morning. He was seen returning home in the van at 6.12am. The swapping of vehicles, the blood splatter in the van, all led detectives to a horrendous conclusion. The amount of blood in the van shows that Ashley was alive when she entered the van. Repetitive blows must have occurred for the cast off and blood splatter patterns that were found. Okay, so I don't have much time left, so I'm going to have to do this one in two parts as well. With strangulation, but he could not determine the when Ashley was still alive. Hi guys, welcome back to my Eagleness podcast. And that the woman had muscle relaxants and alcohol in her system. Sorry, in a bit of a silly. He couldn't, however, determine her blood alcohol level. That is the silly season. There were also injuries, he said, which made me suspect. Now we are on to part two of the Ashley Pegram murder. He also said that he noticed two things out of the ordinary on Ashley's body. Sorry, we know Black what I almost called it, but it's her Ashley Pegram murder. More tape wrapped several times around her neck. Detective Andy Martin so Detective Martin was worried about Edward skipping town, so he arrested him for obstruction of justice. Obstruction Martin of justice, sorry. Of kicking his vehicle and that's from when he lied to police. When the police arrived at his apartment, the first day of he was dragging a suitcase down to the sidewalk and he was about to enter a rental SUV. On the 15th of April, Vanilla was charged with obstruction of justice and held on a $400,000 bond. Police put all of their efforts into finding Ashley's body. Edward's apartment is close to a large reservoir, which has alligators. The Department of Natural Resources and the game wardens put boats in the water and they checked the peripheral area and had a pilot fly over to look for any signs of human remains or human clothing, but they didn't find anything. By now, the investigating team had secured access to Vanilla's mobile phone records. Sergeant Adam Smith began to examine his phone records. On the 4th, at about 6.44am, we found that his phone went to Harleyville, which is north of where his residence is, and it wasn't something in his historical records, i.e. it was out of place. After they have him back at GPS coordinates, back near his work, when he dropped off the work van, if you put all the points together, they equal him in the same general area. Mobile phone records allowed officers to identify all the places but that Vanilla had visited that night, including an area around 29 miles away near Harleyville, and his phone revealed more surprises. On the day that he picked up Ashley, he was texting his girlfriend about what they were going to eat, how his day was going, and also about having sex later when he arrived home. Yet at the same time, he's texting Ashley about their date. Detectives appear.
opinion that Benilla's presentation of himself is that he has a general disregard for females. Disrespect for women as a result of that it was easy for him to take advantage of them. It had been at least a month since Ashley's family had last seen her alive. Detective Martin ramped up the pressure on Benilla, said if out of spite he didn't tell them where her body was before Mother's Day and it went before a jury, they would give him the death penalty. Approximately a week later, through his lawyer, Benilla suggested that they should search a remote wooded area not far from Harleyville. Phone records had placed Benilla in this area on the night of Ashley's disappearance. It was a triangular piece of land, really in the middle of nowhere. You have to take an access road to a frontage road and there's a little community that's been there for 200 years. Way at the end of the road and there's some farmland off to the left-hand side where the triangular piece of wood's kind of poking out into the farmland. It's a very remote area. At 2pm on a Friday, they made the decision to walk in that area and see what they could find. The police, that is, sorry. Every detective in the office went to Harleyville to help search. They found nothing that day. The search continued the next morning. Detective Martin made contact with Low County Rescue Dogs, a volunteer group in the local area. They used their canines that are trained and certified to search for human remains. Two ladies deployed their canines, both Labradors, one black, one yellow. The yellow lab apparently hit on the gases of the decomposition. They notified the rest of the detectives who came up and found a bone, which was recognised as a Cossack's bone, poking out of the soil. They dug a little and found a body of a naked woman, with the exception of a red bra wrapped partially around her neck, and there was another black piece of clothing that was there, and eyeglasses. The detective recognised these as Ashley's eyeglasses from a photograph they had seen previously. Every detective in the office went to They matched the photo the photo um sorry, they matched the glasses that Ashley was wearing in the photos her family put up on the missing persons posters. The body was transported to Charleston where Dr. Nicholas Battles, I believe it is, sorry, conducted a post mortem on the remains. He stated as they were cleaning the body to examine it closer, a couple of things became notable and alarming, including black electrical tape wrapped around her right wrist and looped several times around her neck. This was significant because the finding of the electrical tape, the way it was, told the police that there was likely foul play. Dr. Basil Battles saw several areas of discoloration on the scalp consistent with scalp contusions as a result of blunt force trauma to the head. The autopsy also revealed something very strange. Her toxicology report was positive for two things, ethanol and cyclo... Wrapped around her right cyclobenz- and sorry, psychobenzarine, I believe it is, which is a muscle and relaxant and a highly contru- or a controlled substance. Nothing in Ashley's background indicated that she had ever used any type of drug. Dental records later confirmed that it was, in fact, Ashley Pegram. Detective Martin now had to break the news to Ashley's family. Edward Benilla said that they started talking about two weeks before the Friday when they met. He initially told police he dropped Ashley off at the Sunco petrol station when showing a detective where he allegedly... Sorry. Allegedly... 
dropped her off. He changed his story, saying he dropped her off further down the road. On the 15th of April, they checked the alibi of Shane York, who is Ashley's ex-boyfriend, but his alibi checks out. On the 16th of April, Detective Martin retraces Ashley's steps on the night of her disappearance, starting with the party hosts who confirmed on the 15th of that April, Ashley was there and they had played ping-pong in the garage. Who was Ashley's ex-boyfriend. Forensic evidence from the autopsy show neck fra- April, fractures and head trauma. It proves Ashley was a victim of a sustained attack. Detective Martin believes that the events that night were that they stopped somewhere in the car. He believes it is at that point that Benilla sexually assaulted Ashley. He hurts her, which is cause, causes the blood that's later found in the trunk. Benilla forces a still breathing Ashley into the Sonata's trunk and drives back to a nearby gas station. He took her out of the trunk and laid her on the side of the road and went home to get his workman as it had more gas. He goes back and loads her into his work, workman. Martin thinks that they were driving along and she moaned or made a noise. In Bonilla's mind, it's too late now to let her go. And that's when he beats her to death in the back of the van. He then took her body into the woods to dispose of it. Edward Bonilla was charged with first-degree murder and he was convicted by a jury. Bonilla testified that her death was an accident. He was visibly nervous when he took the stand. Bonilla stated that Ashley had been drinking. He, was visibly nervous he told a story he of accidentally Vanilla hitting her with his mother's car. He, told a story of accidentally hitting her with he said when she got out to use the bathroom at the petrol the station, he had accidentally hit her after he she had became irate and violent. He said he had had to restrain her and that she had died in his arms. Vanilla said he panicked and left her body on the side of the road, but later went back with the van to move her body. Before loading Ashley into the van, Vanilla said he taped a plastic bag around her head because it was bleeding. Vanilla told the court that he did not deliberately kill Ashley. It never entered my mind to harm someone, Vanilla said. It was an accident influenced by the way she was acting. During cross-examination, Vanilla was asked if Ashley's death was her fault. He said no. Most of the second day of the trial was centred around evidence including cell phone records and blood pattern analysis. During the investigation, detectives also looked at Ashley's meet me profile and kick messages. They found conversations between Ashley and Edward from back in March. Dorchester County Sheriff's Office Corporal Bradley Mullis went over his blood pattern analysis, saying he had no doubt that the blood found belonged to Ashley. He said the donor itself was standing or in a position facing the passenger side of the van and was bleeding and swinging themselves, he said. Or the donor was further on the passenger side of the van, laying down closer to the bottom, and something was over the top swinging at them. With Dr Nicholas Batalis, a forensic pathologist at the Medical University of South Carolina, Charleston, talked about doing the autopsy, autopsy on Ashley's body and noted its extensive decomp- decomposition with external injuries to the left side of her head and indentations around her neck. Batalis said neck fractures were consistent with strangulation, but he could not determine if the injury occurred when Ashley was still alive. He was able to confirm that her head injuries were from blunt force trauma and that the woman had muscle relaxants and alcohol in her system when she died.
died. However, he could not determine her blood alcohol level. There were also injuries, he said, that made him suspect sexual assault, but the condition of the body made it too difficult to make that conclusion. He said that he had noticed two things out of the ordinary on Pegram's body. Black electrical tape wrapped around her right wrist and more tape wrapped several times around her neck. Detective Andy Martin revealed that Vanilla said he had been talking to Pegram since March 15, even though they didn't meet in person until the day before she disappeared. Martin said Vanilla accused Pegram of kicking his vehicle and that's why he supposedly drove off, leaving her at Maple and Winter Drive. During the first day of trial, nearly a dozen witnesses testified. Many of them were experts who were closely involved in the investigation. Crime scene investigator Jeff Scott spent 90 minutes on the witness stand describing the shallow grave where Pegram's body was found a month after she had disappeared. Before attorneys had their final say, the jury was given another chance to consider involuntary manslaughter. They could also decide that 28-year-old Ashley Pegram's death was an accident. Defence also claimed prosecutors failed to prove the stains in Vanilla's work van were blood and there was no evidence that Pegram was beaten but accidentally choked. In describing the scene, Vanilla's attorney pointed out that his client didn't even bury the victim but placed her in a two-foot depression, hardly deep enough to hide her remains. Lead prosecutor Don Sorensen countered the defence's claims by noting that Pegram's injuries were not consistent with Vanilla's testimony and doesn't explain her head and neck injuries. Stevenson also refuted that the defence's claims saying that there was blood saying they know that there was blood in Vanilla's van because of a DNA report, but nothing that Vanilla had said explains how her blood got into the van. The prosecution points out that Vanilla was given multiple opportunities to tell law enforcement how blood got on the ceiling and what had really happened to her, but he never did. Edward Vanilla received a life sentence for the murder of Ashley Pegram. Thank you so much for listening. I'll get another one done soon. Bye.